So I know last week you guys um, were here for the nervous system. And today we're actually continuing a little bit off of that. So today we're going over the organization of the brain. Um, this is more geared towards the psych social section of the MCAT. And I'm Janelle. Um, I graduated last year and um, studied biology. So, and I'm also one of the other MCAT tutors here, part of Socratic Med. So yeah, um, and all of these recordings will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. I can definitely put the link of that after um, we go through the whole presentation. However, um, let's just get started because I know it's a Friday night. So you guys probably want to really get to the content. Um, but yeah, all recordings on YouTube um, right after. OK, so um, currently, we're in the 15 week full course. If you um, guys have been tuning in, it started June 17th and we have three lectures per week. So Thursday, Friday and Saturday at 8.30 p.m. EST. Um, we also have one office hour session per week on Sundays at 8.30 p.m. EST. So far it's been kept that way, but if we are to change anything with that, we will update the group meet. And for all of these lectures, we're trying to cover the most high yield MCAT content as possible to keep you guys informed about what you guys need to know for the exam. Um, for our group me, so this was the original link. However, we have been having some um, complications with some spam bots that have been joining our chat. So. I know that one of our other MCAT tutors, Mark, has been changing the link because that has been working now. So for the most updated link, uh, if you, for, I guess, I can definitely update you guys in tomorrow's session, um, as well as it should be on the Facebook group that we have as well. Um, but if you have any questions about joining the group movie, group me, feel free to message me tonight so that I can get that link to you pretty soon um, at the end of our presentation. And then, um, yeah, we usually have updates or changes on the group me, and it's also a great way to contact all the MCAT tutors with specific questions associated with each of the sections of the MCAT. And also for the purposes of the lectures these days, um, if you could all keep your questions to the, I guess, questions about the content during the um, times when I give you guys practice questions, that would be great. Uh, just because we want to, you know, go through the content for everyone. And then um, once we have those mini breaks, that's when we can go over like a bunch of questions together. So yeah. So today the learning objectives are to review the major parts of the brain, then review the major lobes of the cerebral cortex, then review the functions of the hypothalamus within the limbic system, and learn about the effects of damage to the forebrain, review the parts of the midbrain and hindbrain, and learn about the effects of damage to the midbrain and hindbrain, and also at the end, um, review the neuron structure and major neuron types. I know you guys went over it last week. We're just doing like a slide or two and just doing like a check-in with you guys from last week. So um, let's start off with the major parts of the brain. I kind of structured the PowerPoint as going from like bigger to smaller. So that's where we're starting. So the four brain um, midbrain and hindbrain are the three biggest like group of structures when we're looking at the brain here. Um, so you can see the forebrain is here, the midbrain is this upper portion, and the hindbrain is this purple portion at the bottom. So the forebrain is composed of the cerebrum and the limbic system, but also within it, um, it has the hypothalamus and thalamus. And the main functions of the forebrain is for sensory processing. So retrieving signals from the different senses and processing that information for um, the rest of the functions that the body would be doing 
Um, the next one would be the endocrine structures, which is you know associated with hormones and the hypothalamus. Um, finally, with higher reasoning, so thinking um, and processing information as well. Um, the next structure is the midbrain, which um, it's still considered just the, the midbrain, but it's also considered the upper portion of the brainstem. So you hear the light blue portion is the upper part of the brainstem. And that one is responsible for audio visual processing. Next, the hindbrain. Um, it's composed of the pons, medulla, and cerebellum. And it's most responsible for autonomic functions. So for example, respiratory rhythms and sleep. So these are the major parts. And then now after that portion, we're going into the cerebral cortex. And a really common um, acronym for knowing the parts of the cerebral cortex are FPOT. So F for frontal lobe, P for parietal lobe, O for occipital lobe and T for a temporal lobe. And these um, lobes are, it's really good to know like the major functions of all of them. And so the frontal lobe is composed of the motor cortex, which is responsible for body movements. Um, and then the prefrontal cortex is responsible for executive functions. And when I mean executive functions, that's like thinking, problem solving, um, supervising and directing like uh, the other parts of, of the brain and, and you know, their interactions with other parts of the brain. And then um, Broca's area is also within here and it's responsible for speech production. Um, definitely Broca's area, something you guys should keep in mind. Um, next is the parietal lobe. So this yellow portion, it's responsible for um, feeling from the somatosensory cortex. And when I say feeling, it's not in the sense of emotions, but feeling as in touching, um, feeling temperature, feeling pressure and feeling pain. So that's what I mean by feeling in that case. And the parietal lobe is also responsible for spatial processing. So helping you to orient yourself in a space and really understanding the space around you. And then we're gonna go into the occipital lobe, which is responsible for you know, vision. So processing your information that you receive from your eyes. And another feature of the occipital lobe is that it's a striated cortex. So specifically the occipital lobe has um, cells that are striped or striated and it looks a little bit different from the rest of the other lobes. Um, the temporal lobe is responsible for sound. So processing information from your ears. And um, that is definitely associated with the Wernicke's area, which is also in that lobe for language reception and comprehension. Comprehension. Sorry about that. But um, yeah, so these are the four parts. And then now we are going into, oh, can we slow down a little bit? Okay, yeah. Sounds good. Um, okay, so for the cingulate gyrus and the basal ganglia, these are both structures that it's still a little bit debatable about whether they are part of the limbic system or not, which is why I kept them as a separate slide as opposed to um, being with the limbic slide, limbic system slide, which I have next. So um, the cingulate gyrus, it's responsible for emotion and pain. And um, also another function is for predicting and avoiding negative consequences. Um, and the cingulate gyrus is this area here that's a little bit tan um, and also outlined with this red line here. It's just this outer portion. And then the basal ganglia is responsible for motor functions. And so the basal ganglia is this purple area right behind. Um, 
Yes. So to keep you guys, uh, help you guys get oriented where all of these structures are. Um, since we are going into the limbic system on the next slide, let me just show you guys where we are for the next structures because this picture uh, will not be coming on, up on the next slide. So the hypothalamus is this lower portion here where you can see my mouse circling. The thalamus is the larger portion here in the, um, it's right next to the hypothalamus, but uh, it's in the upper right portion. And a good way to remember like the orientation, hypothalamus is usually meaning like under. So hypo is like that portion underneath the thalamus. And then the hippocampus is this portion at the end here. And the amygdala is this yellow portion here. So, okay, now we're gonna go into the next slide, which has quite a lot of information. So the limbic system is made up of the hypothalamus, the amygdala, the thalamus, and the hippocampus. And a really popular uh, acronym as well for the limbic system is HAT hippo, which uh, HAT, so H for hypothalamus, um, A for amygdala, T for thalamus, and hippo for hippocampus. And so the function of the thalamus is mainly for the sensory relay station. Um, the thalamus is able to relay all of this. Um, it's able to receive information from all of the senses, like um, taste, touch, for actually not all of them, most of them, um, except for smell. So that's just one factoid about thalamus because it's actually closer to the lower area, which, um, which uh, is why the Thalamus is mainly responsible for all of the other senses, but just not smell. And then um, the amygdala is responsible for anger or violence and fear or anxiety. And the hippocampus is responsible for forming new memories. So turning short-term memories into long-term memories is mainly um, the hippocampus's function. And then finally, the last part of the limbic system, the hypothalamus, which you guys probably know a lot about because uh, the hypothalamus comes up a lot in the bio section as well, um, is uh, it regulates the autonomic nervous system. So that is, you know, the fight or flight response and the rest slash digest response. Um, fight or flight, usually when you are like startled or, um, all of your senses are heightened and then rest and digest when you're relaxed and not in a state of threat. Um, it's also responsible for regulating the endocrine system. So the major hormones that are associated uh, with the hypothalamus and the endocrine system are epinephrine and norepinephrine. And then the anterior portion of the hypothalamus is responsible for feeding and reproduction. Um, also, I guess, so also for the purposes of the parts of the hypothalamus, uh, the lateral, the posterior, and um, hold on, the lateral, posterior, and ventromedial, um, they come up on some review books. However, uh, I guess in terms of MCAT questions, I haven't really seen them that much. Um, but for the lateral portion of the hypothalamus, uh, it's related for feeding behavior and thermoregulation and sleep. And the reason why I put LH here is because when the lateral portion is uh, damaged in a way, then people feel less hungry. So that's like an acronym to remember. Um, lateral, when it's damaged, you feel less hungry, which means that Usually, if it's normally functioning, then you would be eating normally. And then for the posterior portion of the hypothalamus, it's responsible for thermoregulation. 
Um, and finally, for the ventromedial area of the hypothalamus, it is responsible for eating and satiety, so feeling full. And when this part of the hypothalamus is damaged, it causes people to not be able to feel that satiation. So they end up feeling very much hungry, which is what this acronym stands for VMH. Yep. Okay, so hopefully um, that is relatively okay speed. And now we're going to go into the first question. So I'm gonna give you guys two minutes to think about it and then yeah, because the poll is still not working. Two minutes to think about it and then feel free to put your answer in the chat. Okay, so I see um, a bunch of people have put in answers in the chat. Okay, let me just double check. So I see a lot of C's and I see a few A's and I see a Q, a D. Okay, so um, the majority of you guys got it correct. So it is C. Um, I actually kind of like gave a hint as to uh, which ones might not be the right answers for this particular question, because I actually didn't speak about the cerebellum and pons yet. Um, so we're actually going to get into that in the next few slides as we remember the cerebellum and pons are part of the hindbrain, but so far I've been focusing on the forebrain. So, um, you know, if you see, things that we haven't learned about yet in the, in the lecture, I probably wouldn't be testing you guys that part. So just keep aware of that. Um, so yes, why is it not the other answers is what I'm gonna go into. So um, for C, we definitely know that the hypothalamus is associated with homeostasis and emotions because of um, its relationship with the pituitary gland and regulating all of these hormones that we use to um, promote homeostasis in our bodies. In regards to the thalamus, choice D, the reason why it's not the thalamus is because um, the thalamus is related to the sensory relay station, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, so taking in the information from the different senses, except for the sense of smell. And then for the cerebellum and pons, 
Um, the cerebellum is actually usually for uh, balance and coordination. And the pons is associated with, um, with another portion of that. But I wanted to kind of keep this as like, words to keep in mind for when we're going into the next slide. So I won't, I mean, to the next slide. So I won't um, go through the cerebellum and pons as in depth. But if you guys have questions about the thalamus right now, um, feel free to mention that. Okay. And, um, Yes, Opal, um, I'm actually going to go into what the pons does in the next few slides, once we go into the midbrain and hindbrain. Um, also for, um, sorry, for Samantha, is, uh, is this speed okay right now? Okay, it's okay. Um, okay, great, okay. Good, um, so now we're actually gonna go into one more question. And this um, focuses on the lobes. So this is something that you guys should definitely know for the purpose of the exam. I'm also gonna give you guys again two more minutes and um, yes, put your answers in the chat. Oh, for um, the person who said uh, you came in late, uh, we're covering the organization of the brain ash. Um, okay, so yeah, we've uh, given you guys two minutes. So we've got, let's see, um, we've got A's, D's, oh, a lot of D's, um, A, C's, and uh, four D's. Um, okay, not A. Um, yes, yeah, so we definitely have a lot of mixed responses here. Um, and just to answer Miriam's question, I'm a uh, pre-med. Uh, I just did well on my MCAT. So um, that's hopefully, hopefully this is really helpful for you guys um, with all of the lectures that the other MCAT tutors are doing as well. Um, so I am going to show you the answers. So a lot of you guys said D and the correct answer is D. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Um, so yes, why is it not? So yes, the question says the temporal lobe deals with all the following except. And um, it's a good thing here in the, in the chat, Opal said that she changed her answer because it's an except question, so not A. So we know that 
so I guess one thing about the MCAT, really make sure you recognize the knots and the accepts in the question because those can really uh, easily trip students up sometimes, especially when you're kind of like worried while you're taking the exam. So we definitely know the temporal lobe deals with um, language comprehension, right? And if we go back to the prior slides, let me just... So the temporal lobe is this portion, right? Um, so it's this lower portion and... Um, oh, the except it just happens sometimes. Um, yeah, it really trips people up. So remember on your exam, look out for those accepts and nots because you really can, you know, eliminate a lot of choices by recognizing those two words, especially when you're kind of, I feel like, especially when uh, you don't see those words, then you start seeing a bunch of answer choices that could be the correct answer. Um, but yeah, so the other portions of the question that we were wondering about was uh, memory and emotion. And actually, because you remember the area of the temp temporal lobe, so because it's around this area, within the temporal lobe are the portions of the limbic system which are responsible for um, memory and emotion. So like the hippocampus and the hypothalamus, right? So that's why um, B and C are incorrect because the temporal lobe is that, you know, general like outer shell the four, so remember we went from the bigger portions to the smaller portions. So the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain. And then within the forebrain are those bigger portions, but even within that is where the limbic system lies. So when we say the temporal lobe, it's that outer portion, but anything within it is also counted as being a part of that temporal lobe. And the main, um, function that the temporal lobe is not responsible is for motor skills. Uh, we definitely haven't really been going over motor skills in these past few slides. So um, that's definitely something to be aware of, especially with the lobes. Just remember um, everything that that area encompasses. Does that make sense to all of you guys? Yes, okay, great. <laughs> Good to hear. Um, and so now from this one, we're gonna go into some more uh, content. So I also wanted to give a connection of like what happens when your forebrain is damaged. So there was a case study with uh, a man named Phineas Gage. He was a railroad worker who had a 43 inch long rod lodged through his frontal lobe. As you can see in the diagram to the right, it's kind of like a diagram of how the rod was in his head. It's a little bit uh, crazy graphic, but um, that's how it happened. Um, and the main thing from, I guess the main effect from having this long rod lodged through his frontal lobe is that his personality drastically changed. He just became more bitter and aggressive and this is likely due to it, the lobe, I mean, not the lobe, the rod passing through his um, hypothalamus area and not allowing him to kind of regulate his emotions as he would have before when everything was normal. Okay, so that's one case of damage to the forebrain. And the second case that I wanted to bring up here is patient Tan. So the reason that he's called patient Tan is because he lost the ability to speak and could only say tan. Um, and so what happened was a researcher named Broca discovered a damage to a particular place in the left frontal lobe, which um, is now called the Broca's area because this uh, researcher discovered it and it's responsible for you know, being able to speak. 
And so because it was damaged, because the Broca's areas was damaged, that's why patient Tan could not speak at all. And Broca's area and Wernicke's area are definitely um, topics or concepts that the MCAT psych social section likes to test pretty often. So you guys should just remember the differences between the two. Um, and then we are also going to connect the forebrain to mental disorders associated with the forebrain. So um, the first one is depression. So this is uh, usually seen by abnormal activity in the frontal lobe and the limbic structures. You know, some common, I guess, some common symptoms of depression are the feeling of hopelessness, loss of interest um, from activities. And so depression is actually due to the abnormal activity in the frontal lobe. Good to know. And apply the, um, we really wanted to integrate the concepts with how it could apply to other conditions in this lecture, especially because that will help you guys with um, integrating the concepts a lot um, more easily, I think. And or remember the concepts a lot more easily by integrating the um, concepts together. And the second one is schizophrenia, which um, in those type of patients, you see a shrunken frontal and temporal lobe and symptoms of schizophrenia are hallucinations, delusions, disorganized speech or behavior and blunted emotions. Um, next, dementia is uh, also due to damage to the frontal and temporal lobes. And through this symptoms are that behavior and personality changes and occasionally there's also aphasia. Um, and then finally, there is Alzheimer's, which is a shrunken uh, due to a shrunken temporal lobe that spreads to the frontal and parietal lobe. And this causes symptoms of loss of cognitive functions, memory, and then basic activities of daily living once it gets really serious. Okay. So now we're gonna go into the midbrain. So the midbrain is part of the basal ganglia, which we mentioned a little earlier. Um, they were the parts that were debatable as to whether they were part of the limbic system or not. But within, um, so the midbrain has part of the basal ganglia in it. And then within that part is the substantia nigra, which is where dopaminergic neurons lie. Um, and another part of the midbrain is the colliculi, which is responsible for visual and auditory processing. I guess a good thing to, a good way to visualize it is it's kind of near, like that midbrain portion is kind of closer to the ear area. Um, and then the tegmentum, this part of the midbrain is responsible for like reflexive movement when you're doing like those reflex tests by the doctors when they, I guess, kick. Um, use a hammer towards your knee, it's just a reflex. That's kind of what the tegmentum is responsible for. And then finally is the cerebral peduncles, which is the nerve tract that permits communication between the cerebellum and the central nervous system. Um, and so, yes, that is it for the midbrain. And then, um, we are going into the hindbrain. And so this is where I'm gonna talk about pons and the cerebellum, which we had earlier in that question. So the hindbrain, also known as the brainstem, um, it is composed of the medulla, which is involved in breathing, heart rate and rhythms, blood pressure, digestion, swallowing, and sneezing. Um, and then the pons here, um, it's responsible for arousal, sleep, motor control, and muscle tone. And then finally, um, the cerebellum is responsible for balance, 
coordination, movement, and facilitating motor learning. So new, I guess usually new skills like kind of dribbling a basketball, kind of motor learning. Okay. And then we also wanted to connect mental disorders with the midbrain and hindbrain. So um, Parkinson's disease is a progressive neurological disorder involving motor abnormalities and mental dysfunction. Um, symptoms of Parkinson's disease are slowed movements, a type of tremor, increased muscle tone, abnormal walking, and poor balance. So you can kind of see in this image, it's trying to kind of imitate some of those symptoms. Um, and when these motor abnormalities are severe, patients may not be able to take care of for themselves and have abnormalities of cognitive, emotional, and autonomic functions. Um, and, you know, like we just mentioned earlier, within the midbrain is that part of the basal ganglia, which is where the substantia nigra is. And usually it's actually dark colored, but in Parkinson's disease patients, it's actually not dark at all because um, these dopaminergic neurons are completely lost. Um, so it's not allowing the effects of dopamine to occur anymore here. Um, and then the other disorder associated with the midbrain and hindbrain is schizophrenia in which the mesocortical limbic pathway is affected. It's that middle area, but also with the limbic and uh, cortical area. Okay, and now we're going into another question. So I'm gonna give you guys two minutes and then feel free to put your answers in the chat. Okay, yeah. So I see here we've got a bunch of C's and a few A's. The C's and A's. Um, well, 
Oh wait, the majority of you guys did get it correct with the hindbrain being um, the answer. I realize I kind of gave you a big hint by saying that dribbling a basketball portion. Um, but yes, yeah, so we know that the hindbrain is responsible for procedural learning, um, procedural motor learning, so like dribbling a basketball. So we can see here that the question says a child has experienced nervous system damage and can no longer coordinate the movements to dribble a basketball, although she can walk. Which region of the central nervous system was most likely affected? So um, that was the explanation for C, but for um, the other ones, why they are incorrect. So for D, the spinal cord, because she is still able to walk, that means the spinal cord has not been um, affected, which is why the answer is not D. For B, the midbrain is mainly responsible for, um, it's mainly responsible for the, auditory processing, which is why uh, if, if choice B was affected, then it would probably have to do something uh, along the lines of not being able to process the sound that correctly. And then regarding the forebrain, so if we remember from earlier, the forebrain is responsible for those like higher order functions and executive um, processing in which those cases, uh, those, I guess, functions are not really related to coordinating the movements to dribble a basketball in particular. So does that, does that make sense to everyone? Yes, okay, great. Okay, so then we're also gonna go into another question. So this one really tests you guys, um, I guess hint is that it's really focused on the Broca's area and Wernicke's area and making sure you guys know the difference. So two minutes as well, um, put your answers in the chat. Okay, so we have gotten an astounding number of A's and all of you guys chose A. Yes, yeah, like David said, everyone's getting this. So, um, oh, and Opal, that's a nice one. So she's broken, so A broke uh, um, with, uh, with forming words. So yes, um, the correct answer is A. A, yeah, a stroke patient comprehends speech but cannot move her mouth to form words, which of the following brain areas is likely affected. Um, because she is able to comprehend speech, remember that that's the um, most associated with the Wernicke's area for being able to comprehend that, but being able to actually form words and speak is 
all the Broca's areas function. So that's definitely what you got to remember for that. Um, when would it be Wernicke's area? Ah, so like um, if it said a patient was able to like say these words, but she didn't really um, understand what other people were telling to her. Does that, does that make sense? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so Wernicke is really focused on being able to understand what is coming through your ears, while Broca is focused on getting stuff out of your mouth and speaking. Um, and so, and then the two answers that I put there were kind of like really not related to what we've learned. So um, they were just kind of there for, for distractors that you may often see on the MCAT. So also be aware of like, don't get super scared if you see terms that you don't see right away. Um, not right away, but if you don't, if you haven't studied them or you, you've just never encountered them before. Because sometimes it's just there to, to scare you guys. So, yep. And now we are going to review what we learned last week um, with the nervous system. So what is a neuron, right? A neuron are cells, well, neurons are cells within the nervous system that send signals to other nerve cells, muscle, or gland cells. So I have a visual here on this right-hand side of the neuron. Um, so portions of the neuron is the dendrite here, which is responsible for receiving messages. So they, the dendrite receives messages from these portions at the edge um, when they receive um, usually, you know, chemical signals from other neurons. And so it will go in here and then that's where um, the information will be processed. So the next portion is the cell body or soma. And so this is like really that center portion here. Um, it contains a nucleus in the center it also has Golgi bodies, ER, and other structures that are found in a normal cell. And the really, the main function here is to like, for chemical processing of these signals to send, um, well, chemical processing of molecules to send a signal down to the next portion, which is the axon. So the axon is responsible for carrying signals away from the cell body to these terminal buttons here. And as you guys probably remember from last week, um, there is information about the action potential and that's necessary in order to trigger, trigger signals and um, having those different potentials in order to do so with depolarization and hyperpolarization. Um, I will not be going into that portion in as much detail as last week, but if you wanted to refer to, you know, the specifics of the channels opening and such like that, we have our um, other video fully on the nervous system. So feel free to check that out as well. Um, but surrounding the action, uh, the axon, sorry, surrounding the axon is the myelin sheath, which its main function is to insulate the nerve cell to speed up the conduction of nerve impulses along the axon, so jumping through these little portions. And then um, the axon terminal, which is towards the end, is uh, responsible for transmitting signals to other neurons. So once you know the signal is put down here, then at the end of this terminal and the terminal buttons, that's where signals are being like pushed out to other neurons, which would receive those signals through the, their dendrites as well. And also, you know, a term to know is that the gap in between like the end of the axon terminal and then the beginning of a dendrite is called the synapse. And that's usually where all of these like chemical molecules are laying around to uh, induce another signal in the next, in the next dendrite. Or they're, um, 
reuptaked by the cell or the, the neuron that um, has given that signal in the instance when they want to like end the signal. So yeah, and then um, we are going into the next portion, which are the different types of neurons. Um, so the sensory neurons are responsible for retrieving information from the environment and sending these signals to your central nervous system. Then the motor neurons are responsible for retrieving information from other neurons and sending information to your muscles, glands, and organs. Um, so this picture, I gave an example of the motor neurons. So the muscles and muscle fibers are here. You know, this is just a diagram for that. And then the interneurons connect information from one neuron to the other, and it's only found in the central nervous system. So we are actually, the next slide is our last one. So we had a really quick lecture today, but um, it's of course ending with another question. Um, but I'm gonna give you guys two minutes again, and then that's it for tonight. Um, and let me see the chat. Oh, yes. So yeah, all of the recorded videos are on our YouTube channel. Um, we have been creating a playlist for this 15 week program. But if you want, you can um, check in the whole video section for the videos that we had um, so far in the 15 week program, but also in the eight week program that we actually started before the 15-week program started. Um, so the group me link, I will, hold on, I will definitely give it to you. It's just that um, because of some spam bots that we've been having in our group me, it has a uh, we have been changing our GroupMe link. I believe it's every week now. So let me just quickly find that for you. Oh, David got it. Okay. Yes. But yes, yeah. Feel free to join the GroupMe. Um, that's where all the other MCAT tutors and students are um, chatting away with questions or anything like that. So if you have any questions, feel free to mention it in the group me and we will try to get back to you as soon as possible. Um, and yeah, we will also post any updates and like today when we have lectures, we usually post the link right before it starts. Okay, so um, with that, I see that there are a bunch of bees. It's only bees. <laughs> so you guys are correct. You know, which term describes the space between a neuron and its target cell, the synaptic cleft, which is what we just, well, which is what I kind of just went over. Um, so yeah, um, great job, you guys. Definitely listening throughout this lecture. Um, yeah, so tomorrow we will have another lecture at um, 8.30 as well. Tomorrow we'll be focused on the um, skeletal muscular system in biology. And um, yeah, it will be held by Mark tomorrow. But that's it for today's lecture. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to send a message or unmute on whatever you prefer. Thank you guys for coming. Really appreciate it. Hi, I do have a question. Could you explain one more time? Okay, like um, you were saying something like the forebrain, but within the forebrain, forebrain there was like other, I'm just trying to look at it as, as a big picture, like big to small. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that hierarchy when it comes to like the, systems in the brain like okay yeah definitely um let me just go back to i guess the first hold on the first slide okay 
So um, here is the diagram for the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain. So we see here that like the forebrain is that like very general structure. Um, that's that large pink portion, which you can see it's composed of like the cerebrum, the different parts of the uh, the different lobes of the cortex, and then also the limbic system, which is like the you know hypothalamus, thalamus, um, those portions that we kind of had a zoomed in picture of in the next slides when we were going over the limbic system. Um, so, right, the forebrain is just that general, I guess, the general structure that kind of encompasses all of these little portions within it. Like, does that make sense? Yeah, so it's like, so within the midbrain, the amygdala is in the midbrain. That's a particular area where it's at. Um, for the amygdala, hold on. Um, the amygdala, I believe it's within the, um, yeah, that is more within like the temporal lobe. Like here, like right, it's like right above the, the midbrain. Like I guess in in a way, because that the midbrain is just like this little upper portion. Okay. As you see here. So when we go into this diagram, the amygdala is this portion, this like yellow lobe. I mean yellow circle. Uh -huh. Sorry. You see, so like the midbrain would be like this portion, this pink portion. Oh, okay. So then the amygdala is like here, which is the part of the temporal lobe, but not quite part of the midbrain. Okay. Yeah. That works out. Thank you. <laughs> of course. Yeah. Happy to help. Um, let me see. Are there any other questions here? Um, oops, sorry, okay. I have the Kaplan 2017 book. Is this okay? Because I heard anything after 2015 should work. Yeah, definitely. Um, I feel like the 2017 book is fine. Um, for year to year, they don't really change that much. It's only like minute things. So I think you're good. Um, anyone have Kaplan PDFs to share or Kaplan quick sheets. Um, yeah, we can definitely send those in the group me um, on the MCAT Reddit. I feel like they have a lot of resources for um, Kaplan quick sheets and PDFs. I think all you really have to search is um, just like, you know, Kaplan quick sheets Reddit. And I believe they have like a Dropbox with like all of those documents. They also have like a full PDF of the psych social section. Uh, not psych social action, but like psych social uh, terms that you should know for the exam. So um, yeah, that's a free, it's a free PDF that they have um, within the MCAT Reddit site. Okay, I see. Um, is if, sorry, next question. If dopamine is responsible for Parkinson, what receptors are affected for schizophrenia? Um, Let me just go to that schizophrenia slide. So, um, hold on. Let me just make sure it wasn't. So, um, yes, actually, so for schizophrenia, the dopamine production is also affected. It's just for Parkinson's, the dopamine is lost completely, but for schizophrenia, um, dopamine, there, there is a normal dopamine production. I think sometimes it's too much or too little, um, which is what it's, those, the dopamine receptors are also responsible for cause, um, having an effect on schizophrenia. Hopeful, yeah. Okay, for anxiety, is it GABA or acetylcholine? 
Um, okay, wait. Let's stop share for now. If you've here, let me find the link. I can actually find the link for the psych social as well. Okay, so first, that is the Dropbox link with um, the psych social. They have a 300 page document and they also have a shortened, like I believe it's around like 100 to 150 pages um, for like a lazy shortened version of the Khan Academy psych social. But um, yeah, basically that's, uh, some people prefer the shorter uh, version, some people prefer the longer version. So it's really up to what you prefer, but yeah. Um, okay, and then regarding um, anxiety. I believe um, hmm. I believe anxiety is associated with serotonin, but also um, with GABA. Oops, sorry. Sorry, but yeah, um, related to GABA more than acetylcholine. Okay, yeah, so if you guys have any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat or, or unmute, whatever you prefer. Oh, um, it definitely, Sorry, Anna. It definitely is a. Uh, it definitely is GABA, an inhibitory effect for GABA. Um. So yeah. Okay. So with that, um, everyone have a good night and thank you for coming. Really appreciate it. Okay. Um, if no one has any other questions, any last minute questions, put in the chat. But if not, um, I will be heading out. Thank you guys for attending. Um, okay, and then I'll also post the um, lecture slides onto the group. So, yeah.